practicing the Dhamma, sitting meditation and walking meditation. It's not always easy. It takes a lot of supporting conditions and supporting factors. And all of us, we know that um, sometimes, out of various causes and conditions, we feel very happy and uplifted by watching the breath. And other times, we just simply fall asleep after a few minutes of watching the breath and have no sense of exalted feelings or even worse than that, we have a lot of frustration sometimes. And we also all know the effect that having had a period of inspiration with formal practice, many times things aren't directly repeatable. It's almost like an inbuilt trap that we have a nice surprise in meditation where things do go very naturally, very deep. And then next time we anticipate a similar effect. But all we reap is weariness and frustration and kind of lack of enthusiasm and sometimes we have to force ourselves and do the exercises of our formal practice like we would do our fitness program in a gym and actually not developing much joy with it. So I think that's many times why in the monastery and particularly in Ajahn Chah's style of leading the meditative life we have a lot of wholesome activities around our formal practice. We can focus on the good things that we have been doing. And with this feeling of resting in one's own goodness and resting in one's own merits, then many times we can just develop at least positive energy in meditation. And it brings up an immediate access to the heart. And then from this good feeling, a wholesome attitude towards oneself and, and a knowledge about the harmony that one has created in relation to others, then these feelings possibly really develop into something very, very big in our hearts. And they stay with us possibly much longer than we actually thought. Even when the bell rings, we go back and we're actually happy and go to sleep without much worries. So this is why so many of us are into communal service and are helping out and are trying to be friendly and forthcoming with acts of kindness both in the open and in the hidden. Sometimes even the hidden is even better. You do something secretly and you carry this energy, this potential of, of goodness in yourself and it's like a surprise effect. You cherish that with yourself. You don't have to tell anybody. It's like if it's your birthday on that day and only you know about it. You know why you're so happy and it almost feels like a game convincing the others, like dragging the others into your mind state of happiness. It's addictive. Uh, the power is with oneself. So even the hidden ones, they carry this magic power of making us convincingly happy in ourselves. So these are some things before in a meditation that we can generate deliberately instead of just coming with this gymnastics attitude or counting the hours attitude, we just take stock of our barami, of our blessings, of our spiritual qualities and uplift ourselves briefly but thoroughly and deeply about all the fortune that we have created. 
whether in the open or in the hidden. You can also use all the contemplations of, about the, the good thoughts and the good will that you actually had, even though maybe some of the actions didn't become accomplished because it's not so easy to fulfill all the tasks there are in a monastery like this or in a sangha like this. There may be things left pending, but to dwell on this good intentions, the good heart behind the things that you attempted. This is a, a real source of energy. So this is one way to start the meditation, just to more or less take stock of your accomplishments by body, speech and mind, of good deeds, good actions, good wishes, good will, and we can also use the classical techniques of spreading metta, loving kindness, which we usually start by spreading loving kindness to ourselves. Just completely trying to overcome feelings of negativity and wholeheartedly dwell in the goodness that we know we have and we know others have that sometimes gets buried with other things that are dominant. It's almost like the hordes of Mara coming in and just kind of obstructing them. It's like these little devils come in and uh, obstruct your vision of how good you actually are and wish and deserve to be. So this is not just like painting an illusionary picture it is real that what we do here is in so many ways exemplary and we forget about it when we live in the monastery and even when we have these special periods of meditation where we do our schedule or so we sometimes get into a mechanic mode of being and don't take things to the heart and we forget how painful sometimes things are outside this framework that we are in. This also counts as a huge factor of barami or spiritual rewards that we have already harvested just to simply be here. And sometimes it is a good exercise to go back to the past and think about some peak moments of your personal inner search for peace and happiness and um, recollect the emotional state of mind that you have experienced then. So whatever we have as a recollection of our wholesome barami, the spiritual qualities that we have accumulated all the way to this present moment, will do for making us feel grateful, happy, content and invigorated by the opportunities that we have on a period of practice and may it even be just the most normal period of practice. If we consciously take a moment and revisit some of those key mind-changing experiences, it can make all the difference from a meditation that goes through the emotions to a meditation that is filled with your own heart energy and a meditation that doesn't feel drowsy and dragging and a pain where you're not waiting for the clock. So it does hinge a lot on our conscious effort in meditation, so the effort that we put forth is not to be measured by the amount of time that we manage to sit in one posture or by the technique that we apply or by the external conditions like whether we sit in a public place or in our kuti but the effort comes through our devotion of energy in this supportive way that we actually do know about, that we have come across so many times, otherwise we wouldn't be here. 
So to have one's own skillful means and ways of giving oneself backwind and moral support, picking up on things that came to one through various good causes and conditions that all of us have worked so hard on over the years, then when we use these moments as a tool just to come back to the breath, then we'll feel very, very different than than anything else about um, what we can extract from the scriptures or talks about meditation or analysis of the um, various techniques that, of course, everybody uses. Just to use the atmospheric associations in one's heart more than the explicit things that you do when you sit on a cushion. I think that's what many of our ajans mean by putting forth effort and not just falling prey to this delusion that it's the amount, uh, the number, the technique or the externals of the meditation that count. So just wanted to add maybe that it's not about the beginning of the meditation only, it's also during the meditation that one comes back to this kick start of giving oneself some moral support and giving oneself the reassurance that one has already visited these very deep feelings inside in various occasions. It's also then during the 45 minutes or one hour or three hours or whatever time you spend that one needs to make much of this and come back to it. So I suggest that not only killing time by forcing oneself to be explicitly doing one thing, but to be creative and mainly creative in the sense of finding the motivational source in oneself, why we're here, why we're doing this and how we feel this works for us and going back to that many times. And there will be a point where this automatically takes over your heart, where you don't have to look for it anymore, but it's there. Then the spell is broken and the automatic mechanical trap that one's in is undone and there's a new energy coming up and you can use that in any given way that it suggests itself when it comes.